A continuación les presentamos a John Bogdo, autor de Work Without Jobs, libro que presenta casos del mundo real que muestra cómo las organizaciones líderes están adoptando de construcción y reinvención del trabajo. Como entrevistadora tenemos a Gabriela Prado, quien desde el año 2005 acompaña a organizaciones y equipos en procesos de cambio y transformación en Latinoamérica y Estados Unidos. Cuenta con experiencia en procesos de transformación organizacional de alta complejidad. Tiene un Master of Science en Comportamiento Humano, University of Southern California, psicóloga de la Universidad Católica, eh, facilitadora y certificada en gestión de innovación en Centrum, Brighton University. Es fundadora de, de, de Change Lab, docente de grabado en Latinoamérica y presidenta del capítulo para Chile de la Asociación Norteamericana de Profesionales de Gestión del Cambio. Por su parte, Job Bogdo, autor del libro que inspira esta entrevista, es profesor e investigador de Centro de las Organizaciones Efectivas de la Escuela de Negocios de la Universidad del Sur de California. Sus estudios de investigación abordan el futuro del trabajo y el rol de los recursos humanos. La automatización, recursos humanos basados en las decisiones, entre otros. Es autor de más de 200 publicaciones, incluido más de 10 libros. Artículos sobre su trabajo han aparecido en Harvard Business Review, The Wall Street Journal, Fortune, Fast and Company, Business Week, entre otros. Los dejo con los siguientes invitados. So, today I have the great pleasure to interview John Boudreau. Dr. John Boudreau is recognized worldwide as one of the leading evidence-based visionaries on the future of work and organization. He is known for his breakthrough research on the bridge between work superior human capital, leadership, and sustainable competitive advantage. He has produced over 200 publications, including more than 10 books. His research has been featured in Harvard Business Review, The Wall Street Journal, Fortune, and Business Week. And he's a professor emeritus of management and organization and a senior research scientist with the Center for Effective Organization at the Marshall School from the University of Southern California. And I have to mention this. I had the opportunity to be his student when I was getting my master's degree at the University of Southern California. So welcome, John, and thank you for accepting my invitation to be here today with us. Thank you, Gabriela. Muchas gracias. And it's such a pleasure to reconnect always with a student, particularly one as talented and successful as you. Okay, so, John, so you start writing this book in March 2020, just at the beginning of the pandemic. What were some of the reasons to write this book? Actually, actually, we began the book process way before the pandemic, uh, because the book writing process takes time. So in 2019, we had already begun talking about this book, had gotten a book contract with MIT. So here we were writing this book, and the original motivation was that we had written several books together. And let me acknowledge my good colleague, Robin J. Suthasan, my co-author, and encourage people to look him up and connect with him as he's a thought leader in his own right. So Robin and I had done about five books together, and some of the books were on things like work automation and also workers who were not regular full-time employees like contractors and gig workers. And what we found in those books was that in order to understand those emerging patterns of work, you had to deal with work at a unit that was smaller than the job. And we decided then that perhaps we needed an entire book to describe what we then eventually called a new work operating system that would think of work without jobs, think of work in smaller units than, than jobs. The original patterns that we saw were things like organizations trying to be more agile. And we found that trying to do that with traditional job descriptions was sometimes the jobs were a barrier to agility. The job thinking was often a barrier to fully implementing work automation. Thinking about work as a job was a barrier to engaging workers who might not be regular full-time workers. And all of those things led us to this idea that looking at work in a smaller unit than the job was a way to see it 
uh, more productively and to teach leaders how to see work in a different way. Uh, so a theme of the book uh, is that this is fundamental to so many challenges that leaders and organizations face, the idea of being able to look at work in smaller units than a job. Great. And then, of course, COVID, sorry, excuse me. And then, of course, COVID accelerated all of that. Suddenly now organizations also needed to ask themselves where and when would people work? And again, as I worked with organizations on that issue, I found that very often thinking of work as a job was getting in the way of optimizing the opportunities for things like hybrid work, remote work, et cetera. And the last phrase that you just said connect directly with my next question. Mm -hmm. So what is work without jobs? Help me to unpack this title for our audience. So work without jobs does not mean that there will not be any more jobs. What it means is that it's possible to think of work in a way that is different from the traditional idea that, a, that work and a job are synonyms, that they are the, the same thing and that a job is the only or the best way to think about work. So the idea is that you allow yourself to look at the work inside of a job, the projects, the tasks, et cetera, and you allow those things to, in a way, melt out of the ice cube that is the job. So now they become liquid. Then you may choose to refreeze them or reconstruct them into new kinds of jobs, but perhaps also into new work arrangements that aren't necessarily a job. So that's the basic idea. Work without jobs means freeing leaders, workers, HR leaders, and others, freeing them to think of work not in its job description, but the work elements of the job. Then if we move to the worker, it allows leaders, workers, organizations, et cetera, to think of the worker not as a job holder. Think of that as an ice cube, huh? then if we allow that ice cube to melt, we can see the worker as all of the capabilities that they, that they could bring to the work, not only the ones that they're, they're using in that particular job or a series of jobs. So that's the second element. Let the, let the idea of the worker as a job holder melt and look at worker capabilities instead. Then the third one has to do with learning. And we can think of an ice cube called a degree, uh, like a four-year degree or a two-year certification. And th that's often a signal that a worker is qualified to do the work, that they have the learning. We can think of degrees as melting into individual classes, into badges, into experiences, et cetera. So now the learning looks less like an ice cube of a degree and more like all the elements of that degree, as well as additional ways that the worker has learned. In its fully executed form, the new work operating system would indeed not have jobs or job holders or degrees, but it would operate at the level of those elements of the jobs. The tasks could be matched to an individual capability, which could be learned in many different ways, such as a single experience. So that's, if we really had the full work operating system, it would operate without jobs, without job holders, without degrees. However, that's not necessary everywhere. And very often, the most, the most um, uh, productive application is to say, we will eventually end up with jobs but there'll be new jobs. And, and we're going to allow those jobs to perpetually melt and move the parts of the work from one job to another, et cetera. So work without jobs doesn't mean we don't have jobs, but it means the jobs are not fixed. They're not an ice cube. They're constantly melting and being refrozen into new shapes. Okay, it's, it, it's great to hear from you, but because I, when I was reading my, your book, I, mm -hmm. I, in my opinion, there are two concepts that are key to understanding how the new operation system works differently than the old one. And these concepts are deconstruction and reconstruction. Uh, you already mentioned something about 
these two concepts, and what does it mean to have a new operating system? Would you explain these two concepts and how they are present in this new work operating system? Yes. So let me talk about the, the idea of an operating system first, Gabriela. Thank you for your question. I like to think of an operating system for, as, for example, the operating system in your computer. Now, in the old first early operating systems, when we had computers that filled a room, and you're quite too young to remember this, but in my world, when I was an undergraduate student, we had this thing called a computer, and you had to go to the room where it existed. And you would feed in cards into the computer. There was a reader that read those cards, and each person's job was done in sequence. You'd walk up, you would put your cards in the machine, the machine would run your program or type what you had put in, and then you would go collect it as an as a piece as a paper output, one job at a time. Now, in today's computers, it looks like they can do many jobs at a time. You, you, I'm sure everyone who's watching has opened perhaps their email and perhaps a project they were working on, as well as this video, et cetera. And does that mean that they have separate operating systems for each one? No. What's happened is the the computers now are allowed to do what is called kind of uh, uh, discretionary priority. And that means the computer can decide what to work on. The other factor is in the new operating systems, the one single processor that's in your computer, so that's still very similar to the old way, but now that processor can give nanoseconds of time to each task on your computer. You still have one work source, the processor, but because it's been broken up into nanoseconds, it can do so much more. While you're watching a video, it puts its attention there, and in the background, it may do a little bit of calculation in your spreadsheet. That looks like it's happening at the same time, but it's really just moving very fast from one, one thing to another. The same thing now, think about the work operating system. Jobs, job holders, and degrees is one way to define a work operating system. The work is done in a job when you hold that job. You do the work when you are a job holder, and you we know you can do the work because you have a degree, kind of like the old operating systems. What Ravna and I are suggesting in this new operating system is the idea you asked about. If we deconstruct the, the work, very much like the processor in a computer has been deconstructed into nanoseconds. So we deconstruct the work into its parts. Now we can ask, what's the best way to get each of those parts done? We deconstruct the worker into their capabilities. We could deconstruct it into their time, et cetera. Now the worker can move between the tasks based on their capabilities, based on when and where they want to work, et cetera. So the operating system we describe where jobs are deconstructed into tasks, et cetera, workers are deconstructed into capabilities, allows a much faster, more efficient matching in the same way that your computer works today. Then, as we see the optimum ways to match those things together, we can reconstruct and create a new, perhaps even a new job, but at least a new way of organizing the tasks, the projects, et cetera, and a new way of, of connecting the worker, their capabilities to those. Again, it might end up that we still have jobs, but those jobs are now perpetually deconstructed into their parts and reconstructed in the best possible ways, very much like an ice cube being allowed to melt, and then we reconfigure it in new shapes. And one very fundamental element of the book is that this is happening always. And COVID really showed how much change, how much perpetual invention can go on when we are freed to think of the work not bound in a job or in a place where people need to go to work. So this perpetual idea of constantly upgrading your work, upgrading your job to reflect automation, to reflect new working arrangements, is also a big part of the new operating system. Okay, so, and there are so many real cases examples in your book. So that was great for me because because of that, I was able to understand better. Uh, mm -hmm. So were you able to identify some common and shared practices 
that are right now are helping organizations to navigate this new work operating system? Yes. As you know, as you say, we had examples and we can talk about them if you'd like. We had a, a sort of running example in the book of a uh, distribution center. So that's very much a kind of frontline automation driven sort of work evolution uh, where we show that the jobs of people in that distribution center uh, sequentially changed as the automation came in, as the automation became more sophisticated, as they began to engage workers such as contractors, et cetera. Um, so there's everything from that frontline example to an example of Providence Health focused on nurses and making sure nurses were, were doing the best work and the most vital work that they could do, all the way to things like knowledge workers in call centers and, and cloud uh, designers, et cetera. Now, what are the common themes then? One of them is, and I mentioned this before, that the best organizations begin where there is already a need. So, it is not necessary to change the entire HR system to get rid of all jobs. Very often what you'll find is there are places where there is already an issue that would be addressed better with the new operating system. Automation is, is one. The availability of workers who may not be regular full-time employees is another. Implementing agility is another. Shortages of talent is another. Those kinds of things are clues to HR leaders about where to start. So that's one thing. Start where there is already value to unlock. Don't try to do this where it isn't needed. Second thing, um, don't, don't get limited by the fact that your HR system may not already be uh, organized this way. Very often, the organizations found that they could implement work without jobs without necessarily changing the HR system, whether that's because the workers were willing to voluntarily become more flexible and didn't need extra pay, et cetera, or whether that's because the existing HR system could work through new jobs and through recreating jobs uh, more perpetually. So don't wait for the HR system is another good, uh, you know, rather use these experiments to, uh, to change the HR system. Uh, the, probably the final two, very, very important, are that this is very much about teaching. So, so this framework is not so much about creating a new HR system as it is teaching leaders, workers, et cetera, to think in terms of work without being constrained by the idea of jobs and job holders. So teaching your organization to try this out, to take the opportunity to think this way is very important rather than thinking uh, this has this can't be done until everyone is ready for it. And then finally, the very, very important value of frontline supervisors and managers and the workers that they team with. That's very often where the teaching and where the implementation happens. So it's very important to empower them and to see Many in many cases for the first time, the ability and the creativity that exists in those teams of managers and workers, if you can free them from the idea that they must think in terms of jobs, because that's what HR said is our system. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to go over leaders and managers, because you just mentioned that they have to learn new ways to operate in this new mm -hmm. A work operating system. So in your experience, what are the main challenges that they will face in this new scenario? So this, and for this, I will refer to an article that my good colleague Jonathan Donner and I wrote for the MIT Sloan Management Review. And again, I encourage you to look up Jonathan Donner, another good colleague who is doing very interesting work. And what we wrote about uh, was this idea that leadership is fundamental at a high level, uh, you know, the, the level of CHRO, CEO, et cetera, those leaders will set the boundaries and the targets for the new operating system. So what are the broad, significant goals of the system? Of course, productivity, but also flexibility. And what is the concept of flexibility? 
how is it driven by a sense of purpose, for example, and how will these systems be expected to uh, uh, unleash the purpose of, of the workforce? Um, jo Jonathan and I talked about the guardrails of the system. What is what, Where are experiments allowed to happen and where will we put some limits on those experiments? Uh, for example, we might say that we're going to find some work that is perhaps essential and must be done at the front line. And perhaps we'll say that work is going to be flexible, perhaps in terms of scheduling, but not so much in terms of design. There might be other work where we say the guardrails are, we're going to allow a great deal of experimentation because we have the we can we can mitigate the risk perhaps maybe this would be something like um, desk employees who can work from anywhere because they work at a desk with a computer and the guardrails would be to what extent we will will we allow the location to be worldwide to what extent will we adjust pay for locations so there's some high level things that leaders do once the high level leaders realize that we're going to think in terms of work without jobs we're going to think in terms of letting work melt. Then at the frontline role, this is where Jonathan and I felt there are many things to think about, and we named a few of them. Um, one of them is that leaders will need to be watching technology as it begins to develop, not waiting for it to be applied to the work. Chat GPT is a great example. I have a blog this week on LinkedIn about what we can learn from the Chat GPT generative AI experiences. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen the examples of these chat AI robots in the search engine falling in love with the user, et cetera. I think that's a good example of experimentation. So leaders will need to see things like AI like uh, technology, they need to see them on the horizon and then talk to their workers about what if this technology was here? How might we change the way you work? I'm hoping that today leaders are having discussions about how generative AI might affect their work. So that's one thing, from just, not just from being good at digital, but being good at seeing technology coming. Then a change from process execution to project guidance. So instead of a leader owning a certain number of employees, they work for me, they're in my silo, and I and I execute processes with them, the new work system allows those workers potentially to be doing tasks and projects with multiple leaders. And so the leader's role becomes much more a project manager than a process executor. And, and that's a big change for leaders to think that way. They'll need to think about going from hierarchical authority, formal authority, because the lines on the, on the hierarchy, the lines on the organization chart show these people in boxes with a line to me. Well, that's going to change because those workers may now be floating across multiple leaders, across multiple projects and tasks. And so they'll need to think, leaders will need to think more about empowering the workers to navigate that system and helping them align against the larger productivity goals, purpose goals, et cetera, of the organization. So that the workers, as they navigate flowing from leader to leader, will have some guidance. So it'll be more like a team of leaders who have a pool of workers than like a set of leaders, each one with workers who work for them in a particular job. As we talked about, when automation happens, leaders will need to think about doing that in a more humanistic way. My colleague, Robin J. Suthasen, has written a great deal about this. The idea is combining humans and automation to optimize the combination and the benefits for both. So leaders will have to think very clearly about that. They'll also need to think about a constant focus on things like diversity and inclusion, because these new systems will allow workers to work across multiple managers. They allow for inclusion, not to wait until someone takes a new job, but to be executed at the task level through projects, through a constant flow of workers. So that a leader might see five or 10 times as many workers flow through their supervision because they're working on projects, not just on jobs. So it's not just the five or 10 people that work for me, it might be 100 people that I see through the year on small projects. That means that leaders 
will need to be better at expressing purpose like diversity, inclusion, and belonging, the purpose and goals of the organization. Those now need to be aligned across the team of leaders as they together manage the flow of these workers across projects. So as you can see, this more fluid kind of melting and reconstructing of work means a very different focus of leaders from the traditional, I have these people, they work for me. And beyond that, the leader doesn't need to consider the work. Okay, it sounds great in my opinion, but about the HR role, <laughs> you mentioned that the new work operating system, system brings the opportunity to reinvent HR as a hub for agile work design and innovation. So what are some of the main changes that you see are necessary to start making within the HR role and how HR could facilitate redesigning work to get the most of all the options that we will have or we are already having because of this new operating system? Yes, well, thank you for that question. And of course, I am so grateful always to have had a career where I work with HR and the chance to highlight their important role and how optimistic I am about HR in this world. So as you said, one of the things that I think uh, is uh, a, a conclusion of this work is that if work is going to be perpetually redesigned, upgraded, and changed, that sounds a lot like product and software development to me. So I, I wrote a blog this week about experimentation with work design. And what I said was that the best work policy, the best future of work policy might start with the words, we don't know. We don't know the future of work. Now, does that mean we're going to have chaos or paralysis because everything is random? No, we also don't know what our future products will look like or our services or our software. And that's been true for a long time. Well, how do we deal with that? Well, we have something called agile or experimental design for products, services, and software. And what that means is that we release software and products to the market. We know it's imperfect and we enlist our users to help us find the imperfections. And then we have a very rigorous process to choose the ones that we will improve, to choose the ones that we will not improve right now. And a system that looks at the risks and returns always with the input of the users. So that's what I meant by HR as a hub for experiments. What if HR, was the place where these work design experiments were happening and the place that, that was tracking those experiments in a rigorous and systematic way to keep the ones that have worked, to winnow away the ones that are not working and to stay in constant contact with the users or customers who are the workers and the managers with regard to this product, which is the work. So that means that HR, would not only help to execute the new work operating system, you know, pay systems will pay based on tasks or projects, learning will be measured in terms of experiences, qualifications. So the traditional HR systems certainly will change, but I'm talking about something a little different. The orientation of HR will now include the experiments of work design. That means that HR needs to reach out to the disciplines of product design, software design, agile development, and repurpose those tools to apply to work as the product or the software and users as the workers and the managers. Frameworks like scrums, okay. sprints, the test and learn, et cetera. Okay, it's, it's, uh, so we, we have a we have so many challenges and HR profession will make a difference in this new operating system. And last but not least, so mm -hmm. how do you see this a scenario for the following years? What will be your call to action for our audience today? So I think I would have two large themes, Gabriela, that I would like the audience to take away with them. 
One of them is this idea that work is maybe three. One of them is going to be the idea that work, like so many things in our lives, is now going to be constantly upgraded, constantly deconstructed and reconstructed. So HR needs to begin to adopt a much more flexible mindset toward work and to embrace the idea of constant change. That doesn't mean chaos, but it means systematically looking at work in smaller units and allowing those units to reconfigure based on changes in purpose, changes in in uh, in uh, goals, changes in in automation and work processes. So first of all, think about yourself as managing something that is perpetually changing and upgraded, not something that is fixed and we only change. Um, episodically once in a while. So that's number one, work as perpetually upgraded. Number two is the idea of teaching your leaders and your workers how to think about work and how important your systems are in doing that. Today, your systems teach your leaders to think about work as a job, workers as a job holder, and qualifications as a degree or fully qualified. How can we teach our leaders and our workers to think in terms of work as tasks and projects, workers as a full set of capabilities, and learning beyond degrees? So your job is not just to implement, but to teach as well. And that's where you begin to get the freedom of your organization to work. And then finally, this idea of an experimental design mindset. In the future, I think HR can can uh, really contribute to organizations by being good at work experiments and becoming the hub for agile experimental work design. Okay, so thank you so much, John, for your generosity to share all your knowledge or your research. And I have no doubt that this time with you will give will give us a lot of thinking, will give us a lot of opportunities and challenges. So uh, thank you so much, and I hope we stay connected. And, and as well, Gabriela, thank you so much for such a good interview and for this opportunity to address this wonderful group of folks in the audience. Let me say how grateful I am for the important work that the people in the audience are doing and how grateful I am to you and to them for letting me make a humble contribution to that important work today. <laughs>